Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Bogart, manager of Lawrence Technological University's Detroit Center for Design and Technology and founder of Embrace Creatives. I'm thrilled you can attend our, our live stream event for Yeah, What Lester Said, an exhibit and panel on sustainability in design. Lester Brown has been called one of the greatest pioneer environmentalists and one of Marquis' who's who, 50 great Americans earning his master's degree in architectural economics from the University of Maryland in 1959, he went on to pioneer the concept of sustainable development. Climate change is no longer an abstract idea that might happen sometime in the distant future. It is upon us now, and its effects can be felt via enormous storms, serious drought, and massive flooding here in the Midwest. By, 20, by 2100, rising oceans are estimated to force as many as two billion residents of coastal areas worldwide to migrate towards higher ground and architectural yields in huge swaths of the Midwest will decline by 50% or more if we don't cut emissions. Collaborating with the American Institute of Architects Michigan 2030 District, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, community leaders, activists, artists, green infrastructure experts, and architects, Lawrence Technological University's Detroit Center for Design and Technology and their curatorial partner on Grace Creatives are bringing this absolutely necessary conversation to the forefront before it's too late. The DCDT has put together two and a half months of programming along with an art exhibit, which is currently live on our website, detroit.design backslash luster. I've added the link to our um, Facebook comment section, so go ahead and click on that. Please visit our page to sign up for all of the events that interest you and enter the Art Gallery and Architecture Board exhibit. Everything is free and open to the public. Today's live stream event is titled, We Can Build a Carbon Neutral World, and boasts moderator Evelyn Doherty, Honorary Affiliate, AIA Michigan, Operations and Events Director of AIA Michigan, with speakers Jan Culbertson um, of Collaborative Architecture, Doug Selby, founder of Metal Art Design and Build, Matthew Brockhoff, Esquire, principal of Thrive Collaborative. You're gonna learn more about these people in a minute, I'm just getting their names out there. And Katrina Kelly Patu, I apologize if I screwed up your name, PhD, economic and energy system strategist for Smith Group. Our built environment is a major source of greenhouse gas gases, GHG emissions. To meet the climate energy head on, we must immediately set on a path to design and construct carbon neutral buildings and transform our urban, urban environments on a regional level. Viewers today will learn how to implement the zero code and immediate strategies to achieve embodied reductions in the built environment. You will better understand NZEB design and living better challenge criteria and their application to both single buildings and a community and finally, you'll be able to identify projects, infrastructure systems, and strategies that address both adaptation and mitigation as part of system, systems thinking. Solutions that connect the dots between national and local goals and operational excellence. AA Michigan is offering CES certifications for this presentation for members and non-members alike. You can see our main Yeah What Lester Said page for the files or contact Evelyn after the event at AIA Michigan. Because we are live on social media, you have the ability to ask questions and comment. So to participate, please type your comments below the live stream. Um, we will see them and respond. We will tell you when uh, we're gonna be answering your questions. We'll be doing it in between each presentation and then at the end. It's time to begin, so I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Evelyn Dougherty. Evelyn, is the current operations and events director at American Institute of Architects, Michigan. Evelyn was named an honorary affiliate member of the American Institute of Architects, Michigan in 2015. She's been with the organization for 26 years and I'm very happy to introduce Evelyn, my friend. Thank you very much. Hold on one second. I'm going to set up the back end here and get you to Evelyn. Thanks, Evelyn. I'm gonna get handed over to you. Thank you, Andrea. Hi, everyone. I want to tell you just a little bit more about the American Institute of Architects, Michigan. We're a nonprofit architects association, and some of our areas of focus are public advocacy, government affairs, continuing education, like today, and our emerging professionals. Our vision is advancing society through architecture 
and our mission is to champion the profession, nurture our chapters, and build Michigan better. We are hosting some more continuing education seminars next week. Um, we are having a free one with some economists from the AIA and the Association General Contractors of Michigan. You can visit our website at AIAMI.com to learn more about us and about our programs. Now I'd like to introduce everyone that will be talking today. We've got a brief introduction from Andrea, and I'll give you a little bit more about them. First off is Jan Culberson, FAIA, Lead AP. She received, her, she received her Master's of Architecture degree from the University of Michigan, and she has been practicing architecture for nearly 40 years. As a senior principal at A3C Collaborative Architecture, she has focused on sustainability, not only in her practice, but facilitated Architecture Plus 2030 continuing education sessions in Southeast Michigan, and continues to promote education and advocacy for carbon neutral future. Next, you will hear from Doug Selby. He is a building science expert and co-founder of Metal Arc Design Plus Build. A graduate of the Michigan State University Chemistry Department, Doug worked as a pharmaceutical chemist and cancer researcher before leaving the laboratory to become a builder, eventually co-founding Metal Arc in 2004. Today, the company employs 45 designers, craftsmen, and client support staff. Doug spearheads Metal Arc's emphasis on health and sustainable construction. Next, you will hear from Matt Bro Brokaw, and he is the founding principal at Thrive Collaborative, working to create life-enhancing buildings that harvest their own energy and water, create zero waste, and are beautiful and res restorative. He is a developer and currently creating Viridian at Country Farms, a net zero energy mixed income neighborhood targeting living, Community Challenge Certification and honored in the United Na Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Ooh, sorry, a little bit of a mouthful. Local projects going. Matt is a former advisor to the University of Michigan Blue Lab team, seeking solutions for healthy, clean, and decentralized water. Next, you will hear from Katrina Kelly Pitu. She is an expert in energy systems and urban development. Currently, she acts as an economist and energy system strategist at Smith Group in Pittsburgh. She has focused her life's work on understanding the connections between resilience, decarbonization, and infrastructure development. As such, she has worked alongside policymakers at the supernatural, national, and local level to help create the policies that are needed to transition society to a more sustainable means of development. So first, you'll be hearing from Jan, and uh, I, she'll be up next, and I'll see you at the end. Thank you, Evelyn. I just want to make sure we transition screens. So we can build a carbon neutral world. In fact, we must and we will. So let's get started. We must because we are spewing about 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution to the thin shell of our atmosphere every 24 hours, perhaps a little less during COVID, as if it were an open sewer. That thin, fragile atmospheric layer is thickening and thus keeping in more of the heat that makes our planet special. But that increased heat also will change our planet. In the 2015 Paris Agreement, every nation in the world agreed to work together to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. And even though the U.S. has said that they are opting out, they can't legally withdraw until the day after the 2020 presidential election. We have hope. So many cities and counties and countries have declared a climate emergency, including many in Michigan. An emergency in an emergency, timing is everything, and we've definitely experienced that with the COVID fight. So what's so special about this timing? So if we're going to keep global warming below one and a half degrees Celsius, uh, we have a carbon budget. And in fact, at, if that budget's at 500 gigatons of CO2, we have about a 50-50 chance of uh, keeping our global warming below that 1.5 degrees Celsius. To increase our chances to 67%, uh, we could lower that budget to 340 gigatons. 
And if those of you that are uh, familiar with the Architecture 2030 Challenge, um, originally it was based on that 50% reduction by 2030 and a carbon budget of 500 gigatons. But because of the increase in climate change events um, and the lack of some nations doing what they need to do, um, we really need to pick up the pace. And so we're proposing to do a 65% reduction by 2030 and a phase out in 2040 instead of 2050. So it is an imperative on all levels from local, regional, national, and global. How do we transform from a carbon dependent to a carbon neutral, a carbon positive world? So let's start with Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor did a snapshot of their 2018 emissions and it's pretty typical of many um, smaller cities. But what's interesting is that one large institution is responsible for about a third of the community's total greenhouse gas emissions. So working together between the city, the community and that institution is critical. So, uh, Ann Arbor recently um, unanimous, unanimously adopted a carbon neutrality plan that has six core strategies. Uh, the first is powering our electric grid with 100% clean and renewable energy, uh, transforming from uh, fossil fuel based uh, heating cooling vehicles to all electric, significantly improving the energy efficiency of all buildings and reduce the miles we travel in vehicles by at least 50% and significantly changing the way we use, reuse and dispose of materials finally enhancing the resilience of our people and place because climate change is happening and we do need to adapt and mitigate. What is interesting to note is even with all of these strategies uh, coming to pass by 2030, the estimate is we'd still have to offset 37% of the community's emissions. Right, so we deal with the built environment. How do we achieve zero? And really want to look at uh, a variety of policies and a variety of strategies. New construction, the bottom line is we need to only build zero net carbon buildings, existing buildings. Any renovation we go into needs to take seriously deep energy upgrades. And thirdly, we need to start tracking and reducing the embodied carbon within our buildings. How do we do that? First, how do we get energy efficient new construction? Architects, contractors, we need to design and build them, but we also need to advance policies and improve our, our, our energy codes. And uh, one of the ways that we can do that is adopting zero code. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the other thing is to uh, no longer expand our fossil fuel in infrastructure. So two tools that we have for that, um, the zero code, which really establishes energy reduction baselines and targets uh, to compare buildings energy performance and zero tool, which is great for uh, generating an estimate of energy consumption of a building or the actual um, inputting the actual energy of a building and establishing what you need to meet the uh, zero code. So zero code, the concept of zero code is you design an energy efficient building. And now we have ASHRAE 90.1 2019. Um, that can be the minimum. You address the remaining energy uh, of the building with either on-site renewable or off-site renewable energy or offsets. This is what the input screen is. This is a free software. You link up, you define where your building is, the number of stories, you use ENERGY STAR um, use types, put in the square footage. You can use, um, uh, if there's an on-site, um, it'll, it can calculate the, using default values, the area that might be available uh, for renewables. And you just hit generate and you get a report that tells you the estimated building consumption based on designing to ASHRAE on 90.1, 2016 at this point, the renewable energy requirement to become net zero, the potential for what you could generate on site and what you'd have to procure off site. And the assumption of what the uh, PV is and the estimated area for those collectors. 
So it gives you some parameters very early in your design phase. And then zero tool. Zero tool I use quite a bit with the 2030 district. You can enter um, all of the building use details that you get from um, uh, the, the, uh, the building owner. Um, and you can use a default values or you can input your own operating hours and, and number of people in the building and the building type. You can actually input what you want. 65% reduction would be meeting that uh, reduction target for 2030. You put in the annual energy that that building purchases. If there is on-site renewables, you can enter that data as well. And then it gives you a benchmark. It gives you your baseline based on 2003 CBACs. It get, tells you where you are on your path to zero, your building, uh, and then your target EUI based on the 65% reduction. So you really do get a building summary and you can target then where you're going and how many uh, additional renewables, if you can add to that or what the offset you'll need to get become uh, a zero net carbon building. So just in summary, you have your target, what you need to achieve through energy efficiency, on-site renewables, and then your off-site renewables or offsets. We have uh, a real good opportunity in the next year, 2021, uh, the Michigan legislature will be opening up the energy code and will be advocating to adopt the 2021 uh, International Energy Code, Construction Code, with the Renewable Energy Appendix. And that will give localities the option of adopting that appendix. Um, here are some resources. There are um, multiple cities right now that are looking at trying to do a um, energy benchmarking, transparency, um, time of sale, energy audit uh, policies. Uh, if you personally want to offset your current um, uh, or and reduce your carbon footprint up with your electricity, uh, you can enroll in the My Green Power Wind and Solar Program through DTE. You can do that for your residents, for your commercial building. Um, another resource is there are um, Achieving Zero Energy, ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guidelines for both schools and office buildings. Good resources. All right, so we've talked about new construction, existing buildings, embodied carbon. Embodied carbon, you also want to start taking into account because the industry uh, global CO2 emissions is about a third of our total emissions. And certainly building materials and construction contribute significantly to that. And in fact, as we create high performance buildings or renovate buildings to buy um, high performance, that embodied energy never changes. So it becomes a larger and larger part of the CO2 emissions. So in true to form, the 2030, <laughs> Architecture 2030 issued a 2030 challenge for embodied carbon, which again says, okay, a 65% reduction by 2030. How do we do that? All right, whole building approaches, right? Um, Architecture 2030 has issued a, a carbon smart materials palette, which looks at some specific materials so you can understand a little bit better how you can reduce embodied carbon and, and select those materials. And there are two um, relatively easy to use um, carbon life cycle cost analysis. Um, one is Tally that interfaces with Revit and AutoCAD and Athena, which has been around for quite some time. But you don't even need to go to um, a lot of specific data uh, if you look at the big picture. And the big picture is that 55% of the building structure and substructure um, represents uh, a big chunk concrete and steel, uh, and, and then 33% is the enclosure of the building. So if you target just the um, structure of the building and the, the envelope, uh, you can affect 88% of the embodied carbon of a building. So let's focus on you know concrete and steel. One of the things that we can do is if you use electric arc furnaces um, and specify that in your, um, in, in your buildings and a 97% recycled steel content. You can reduce those CO2 emissions by about 50%. That's huge. Concrete, uh, cement is the, is the, the 
the uh, carbon impact of, of most concrete. So look at fly ash and slag. The University of Michigan um, materials, engineering materials research has come up with a uh, low carbon, high um, strength concrete that they're, they're trying to get to market relatively soon. The other thing is insulation. If you look at this, is there a reason that we should be really specifying um, extruded polystyrene? Make other choices. Uh, resources. Uh, I really encourage people to join the Carbon Leadership Forum or check out their website. They have an excellent uh, webinar series uh, and a guidebook for life cycle assessment of buildings. Uh, the Carbon Smart Materials Palette uh, and the Architecture Magazine early this year, January, February, had uh, a, a carbon issue, which has just a wonderful um, group of very well-researched um, articles on um, carbon neutrality. These, and this will be recorded, and if you want to um, get all of these resources, uh, there are a lot of resources that talk about the methodology and the tools that are very accessible and reserve September 8th and join the Carbon Positive Reset. It's a global teaching and it's an all day event, all online, all virtual and all free. So register for that at carbonpositive.org. Thank you. Hi, Jan. So what would be one way that we could help encourage clients to find the priority of carbon neutra neutrality in the projects? Yeah, and I think that's, a, that's really important. And part of it is the way you talk about uh, carbon neutrality. I think you talk about, um, specifically in Ann Arbor, um, when I talk to people uh, ab about what's coming, uh, we are, We've declared a climate emergency. Uh, we're looking at carbon neutrality by 2030. So how are we gonna get your building there? It's not a choice. It's part of the parameter that you start with and one of the assumptions that you go with. And with COVID-19, it's had a, a, a negative impact on us. What do you think we can find the finances needed for the transformation into it with all of this with COVID-19 happening. Yeah, and I think that is a big question and a lot of people are, are asking that. Um, and if you think um, if, if you think about what we need to do and the jobs that we need to bring back, uh, when you look at things like the Green New Deal, the investment in uh, a low carbon future, I think we all need to be advocating for that. And the other thing is to, uh, in Ann Arbor, the university, the city, the county are all really getting on the same page and using their resources to help each other, want, help each other get there um, all at the same time. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll join you later for our uh, panel questions. <laughs> Jan, we have a request to share the slide with all of the links. Is there any way that you can, and even if you don't pull it up for the screen, um, maybe we can get it and put it in the comment section. Oh, you know what? I'll put it in, I'll copy it and I'll put it in the chat. Perfect. And next is gonna be Doug Selby. Hi, everyone. Well, um, I wanted to say thanks for attending. Um, for my part of the talk, I'd like to speak from a contractor's perspective uh, about our experience in building new uh, net zero buildings and also uh, perhaps more importantly in uh, retrofitting existing buildings, uh, of which there are about 145 million in the United States. So um, let me go ahead and get this started. So. Um, you know, I, I know that I'm probably preaching to the choir to some extent here today, uh, but um, uh, in my opinion, it's not like we really have a choice in this matter anymore. 
we've made the bulk of this problem in just a few generations and we have about one generation to fix it. Otherwise we are consigning our grandchildren and their children to uh, more or less a literal hell on earth. Um, if we do not act now and, 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 uh, and make substantial gains in the next few years, um, uh, the global temperature will rise by four degrees Celsius or more before the end of the century. So what does that mean? In, in North America alone, a four degree temperature rise, um, Celsius temperature rise, would mean that an area the size of California will burn every single year in wildfires, rendering most of the, of the West uninhabitable. Um, catastrophic droughts and floodings will, you know, hammer the country's breadbasket, and I would imagine making farming, you know, di very difficult, if not impossible altogether. Uh, category five and as yet unseen category six hurricanes um, will pound our coastlines every year as the oceans warm, and um, you know the the current pandemic that we're in right now will seem like a warm up act compared to the uh, the public health nightmares we'll we'll experience in that regard. So in short, uh, it would be a complete breakdown of our societal and our governmental structures. Um, the world uh, debt right now is 223 trillion. Uh, you know, debt is based on future stability and nothing more. And so um, there will be no money to react to these problems, let alone solve them as they become more and more severe. So we have to solve this problem. And really, honestly, it starts with uh, design and construction. So why does it start with us? Well, first of all, is because design, uh, I'm sorry, construction and building operations are the biggest contributor to carbon emissions. They're 39% of the total global emissions. Uh, the United States is the second largest contributor. Uh, we're well behind China. Um, and the, uh, but the US has historically been uh, seen as a global leader. Our influence is waning in recent years, uh, but we can still influence global policy and we still are a mighty economy uh, that, can, that has weight. Uh, or we can continue business as usual and nothing will change. The United States has and continues to have a unique position in the world. And I believe part of that is because we come from all over the world, all other countries. So we must change ourselves and we must demand change from our trading partners. So 11% of our emissions come from the embodied energy of construction. And that in itself is a significant portion. As Jan was mentioning, you know, uh, concrete and other high carbon materials are responsible for the lion's share of that. Um, uh, I was glad, Jan, that you pointed out XPS foam as being a, a, a particularly egregious material. It is. Um, and uh, while the material, functionally speaking, from a from a uh, 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 engineering perspective or from the, the actual um, uh, uh, the, the benefits that it has is, is quite amazing. But when you blow uh, things with hydrofluorocarbons, you are creating, you know, in some cases, 50, 60 years of carbon emissions that you're baking right into that building. So no matter how you, how efficient you make it, you're not going to overcome that. So, um, but we can make buildings that are, are carbon, carbon positive and sequester carbon. We have the technology if we choose to deploy it. So, uh, and we can also make uh, building materials that don't poison our ecosystem. Um, and we just really honestly have to look beyond first costs and consider full life cycle costs. So these decisions have a lot to do with design, but they also have to do with government policy and private investment. The ongoing um, operational emissions of a building are an even bigger story though, and that's really all about design. At 28%, we can't afford to ignore that. And you can't really build efficient buildings if the designs themselves are inherently un inefficient. Uh, it's true that builders have a big part to play in their operations and their willingness to change methods and technologies will count for a lot, as does their attitude towards building for quality and commissioning appropriately and, and doing those steps in a, in a professional manner but the big savings is in design. Um, we can make structures that are zero energy or even net positive, but it must be taken into account from the start. And I, I agree with what Jan said about that is that that is where, that is where efficiency starts is when you make the commitment uh, to, to move forward in that direction. The work design professionals do has to push the industry forward. So how do we make the jump in practical terms? Uh, well, first of all, it starts to, it has to start with our realization of our role here and our, our, our willingness to go a little further and do better than what we're doing now. So um, talking about our experience with it, um, this is a project in the planning stages in Ann Arbor. 
Uh, it's a student uh, rental where the current building is outdated and in poor structural condition. It's in a historic neighborhood, so extra care has to be taken with the building form. And it's on a really small lot. So not only are there logistic challenges, but also a lot of zoning challenges. Um, we started this uh, project with a commitment to go all the way, however, and if all goes as planned, this will be the, the first multifamily building in the world to achieve both living building challenge and passive house certification. Um, to achieve that, we need to, first and foremost, to have more density on the site. Uh, and fortunately, that seems to be what city planners are looking for as well. So that makes that a little easier. Um, it'll be an all electric building that uh, makes more energy on site than it uses in a year. Uh, there is very low embodied energy as we are also um, uh, uh, going to reuse, uh, reduce concrete use greatly. Um, be careful with our materials and re re reuse most of the existing materials in the, in the building that exists there now. Uh, the building will also be net zero water. Uh, there's enough water that falls on the site to operate the building and all its functions uh, without having to ever import water in from the city. And we have the technology to do this, um, but the city won't allow the, uh, these systems at this point. So we're doing everything we can to get as low as we can go legally and then reducing the rest of the way through what we call scale jumping, which essentially means that we'll be retrofitting, paying to retrofit other buildings in the area to be much more water efficient until we uh, take up the entire amount that, um, that this building will have to take in from the city. Um, there are no toxic chemicals in the building. Um, it's a, a great deal of emphasis is placed on biophilia, generating a healthy environment uh, for the occupants, but also pollinators, birds, other wildlife. And that can happen even on a small city lot without much, uh, much opportunity for green space. Um, there are a variety of other items that also contribute to overall to this uh, building sustainable. And we are not only seeking living building challenge, but also um, you know, in passive house, but also um, we'll be going for a lead platinum certification, well certification, and also uh, zero energy ready. Um, speaking of zero energy ready, I, I believe this is an important program because if we build in this fashion and our utilities are able to produce energy with 100% renewables, we can get to carbon neutrality with any building, even if the building itself is not net zero energy on that site. Um, so, so building uh, homes that are uh, and, and other buildings that are ready, uh, ready for net zero energy um, will generally be pushing us into electric uh, electrification of buildings and other things that will help us uh, down the line get there. So there are a lot of barriers to adoption uh, in these principles, however. Um, Number one is uh, municipal processes. Uh, Saul Griffiths, a noted physicist, inventor, and entrepreneur, uh, lists municipal bureaucracies as one of the top five things that are inhibiting our transition to a green economy. And ironically, the most progressive cities are the ones that are um, the worst at it. <laughs> um, uh, we need uh, to streamline our processes and we need more incentive for developers to do the thing, uh, the right thing. But Part of it is just what I would say, uh, what I'd say is call it, you know, getting over ourselves. Um, there are too many people who want to control how our cities develop and sometimes that cacophony of voices by well-meaning citizens that have a lot of pet issues makes it get difficult to get anything done and it, and it creates a, a situation where um, uh, the city um, people that are involved in planning and the, and the politicians and things like that are, 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 are scared to move forward with uh, something that may Get them in trouble or, or make people yell at them essentially um, but there are ways to get over all this without trampling people's rights uh, another problem that we've seen in building uh for the last 70 we've been building though you know in the way we've been building in the last 70 years is just plain obsolete uh, construction ranks near the bottom uh, for technology adoption and that's a big problem so a green future will also include a lot more uh, precision with components built off site and builders need how to uh, to learn how to build uh, different and build better. When structures are built to passive standards, uh, heating and cooling um, can be um, uh, 80 to 90% more efficient. Um, and electrical heating and cooling with heat pumps become a breeze when you're, when your building structure is really, uh, really efficient. Um, they also are a lot more comfortable. Um, but there's a kind of a dearth of industry professionals out there who understand cutting edge uh, mechanical systems. So that has to change and the technology needs to evolve and get better too. 
European and Asian countries are doing it, so we really don't have an excuse, in my opinion. Um, financing is one of the big issues, though, and, and of all the inventions in human history, I believe that financing has had the most profound impact. And we can, as a society, if we agree that deep green buildings are built for the long term and have financing to match, all things become possible. And this building I just showed you is a great example. As a commercial building, uh, the only financing that's available, uh, readily available, is a 20-year uh, uh, note. Well, the building can't pay for itself on a monthly basis uh, without uh, at a 20-year note. It needs to be a 30-year uh, mortgage or above. Um, you know, the Germans uh, have pioneered 40 and 50 year financing for passive and zero energy project projects. And at that level, anything is possible. And there's a, there's a reason that they're leading the world in green technology. And that's a big part of it. So another big issue is that we've been subsidizing the fossil fuel industry for more than 100 years, even though it's the most profitable industry in world history. Um, the world's annual subsidies for fossil fuels are five point two trillion dollars. That's annually. And in the US, that's uh, about $650 billion annually, with 20 billion of that just being taxpayer money that is literally handed to them directly. So don't misunderstand me. I believe that the fossil fuel industry has a role to play in solving this problem. And I'm not advocating that we undermine market forces. I just also believe that we should uh, not be subsidizing something that will destroy our grandchildren's future. So if those industries pay the true cost of their products, we would start to see the market shift overnight. So um, the last item I have here is NIMBY concerns. And uh, this many times goes back to municipal government. So as I said, the loudest voices can cow politicians and bureaucrats into uh, silence and inaction. And so perhaps we need to be louder voices ourselves. And we also need to have our leaders backs when they make unpopular decisions that, um, that maybe are the right uh, thing long-term, but we can't let the negative Nellies rule the day or this problem can't be solved. We don't have as many concerns in getting approvals to retrofit existing structures, um, but there are some issues that will get in the way here too. Uh, and a lot of these are actually technological and structural in nature. Uh, so um, uh, structures that exist are difficult. Um, and how do you get the money to pay for it uh, and, and make it make sense financially? And also there's just a lack of contractors to do the work at the scale that is needed. As I mentioned, there's 140 million homes in the United States and about 5.6 million commercial buildings. So almost all of them need to be retrofitted in some regard, and most of them quite deeply retrofitted. Um, so we need to retrofit our current assets in a really big way. Uh, so I wanna talk about how we did it with our building, um, Metal Arc Design Builds headquarters, uh, which like many was, uh, was resistant to energy retrofits as, as many buildings are, and particularly brick buildings can be a, a particular problem. So. Um, this building started life as the Arabelle Wagner School in 1874. Uh, it was built, uh, it's a one-room schoolhouse on the western edge of the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, now, over the years, three distinct additions were put on, uh, 1924, 1952, and 1989. Each bears uh, the construction details and the designs of that era. So in a weird way, it's kind of like a perfect mix of all the types of buildings that we've been doing over the, you know, a uh, long time in our country anyway. Overall, it's really well built. Uh, when we purchased it in 2011, it was in terrible cosmetic shape. Um, there had been a flood in the building, so it was moldy and it smelled. Um, the windows and finishes were awful and it was uh, cut up into a warren of rooms. Um, the roof had a lot of leaks and there was little insulation, so it was an energy hog. And so in other words, it was perfect. Uh, we had been looking for the right home for years and we immediately knew that this was the right place for us. Now, uh, three years later, we had been able to get a sign here, um, but uh, we still had not been able to do anything to tackle anything but the cosmetics so we could bring clients into our buildings. Um, finally, we were able to get a Michigan Saves loan uh, to not only repair the roof, but at the same time, uh, we needed to incor incorporate energy saving features, which we wanted to do anyway. So um, we started the structural repairs here. Uh, we stripped the roof, um, made a lot of repairs. We actually ended up having to rebuild substantial portions of the roof um, that were uh, uh, damaged beyond repair. Uh, removed the side lights because we had this nice Eastern face that would uh, get sun, sunlight until about you know one or two in the afternoon. Um, when we uh, were redoing the roof, we put these ventilated nail base panels to provide a R25 of continuous thermal break over the entire roof while ventilating that top shingle uh, layer. 
And um, this is a great technique. Uh, and uh, so with this four inches of, of, of continuous foam, we also had another uh, 12 inches of, of material underneath that to really make this a high R value roof. Um, this is those nail, nail base going panels going on. Uh, and then we uh, went with uh, no, no longer in existence, but uh, or at least from Dow anyway, but the Dow Powerhouse solar shingles uh, and installed those. This is Dow Powerhouse 1.0. Uh, this was their first uh, uh, trial run at it. Um, this is 3.8 kilowatts of, of power. And interestingly with these, we put these on the east face because they are A, a shingle product, and B, um, they, they actually were more efficient for making solar energy than panels on an east and west face due to the way they handle oblique sunlight. Um, they came out with a new method, uh, Dow Powerhouse 2.0, uh, which we put on our, um, on our uh, rear facing uh, part of the building. And that was uh, 4.2, so a little bit more kilowatts uh, for a little bit less surface area. Kind of cool. They also had a better kind of a glassy look, uh, a little more attractive. And then we um, put 10.4 kilowatts of flat panel array on our, on our roof line. And you can see that as we built up the roof, the, uh, the, the roof lines become a little thicker, a little bit more substantial, which actually adds to the cosmetics of the building. Now, we did all this and um, we were a little surprised that our energy bills were not going down as far as we wanted. So we installed uh, uh, the energy detective, a TED device, and we found out that our well was bad. Uh, we um, we uh, had to replace our well because all the water that was coming up was immediately falling back down. So the well never stopped running. And that was literally more than half of our solar output that was using to run that well. Um, we didn't know that because the well was in a concrete building that's sort of attached, but uh, you'd have to crawl in there. So we didn't hear it. And I would hazard a guess that there are millions of, of buildings across the United States that have that problem right now or people don't know it. Um, and um, so these are the type of issues that uh, can really stand in the way and measuring what you're doing is so important to tackling these issues. So uh, we had to get a new well. And while we had the drillers out there, we said, hey, let's go geothermal at the same time. So this is, this is us putting our geothermal system in. Um, now, uh, once we were done, uh, it looked pretty god awful and there were lots of weeds that kind of immediately grew up in the clay, but we couldn't get anything and we wouldn't have been able to grow grass very easily. This was all just kind of churned up clay here. So we decided to go with a native prairie. So this is the before, and this is our native prairie afterwards. Um, the biophilia, uh, the biodiversity in this piece of our land is many, many times uh, what it is in the other areas that are just you know mowed grass. Uh, you go in here and you can just hear all kinds of stuff happening in there. So it's very satisfying from a, a biological perspective. Um, and we did a number of other things. We tightened up our building. We looked for uh, for other circuits that were, uh, you know, using too much power, things like that. Um, but uh, the net results of it were that we were able to reduce our building to uh, an EUI, an energy use intensity of 12.2 uh, for this building, which is um, far, far below what the baseline EUI is for uh, uh, office buildings in, in in the state of Michigan at 75.2. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting closer and closer to being net zero. In fact, uh, probably another, you know, 16 or 18 kilowatt, uh, kilowatts of solar would bring us there and beyond. Um, so uh, we do have another building plan for the site. And at that time, we will be uh, not only building that to be a passive building, but also um, taking that to net zero. Um, so we're ahead of the schedule. Uh, that also has a financial impact. Um, so. The simple payback on this, if you take energy inflation at 2.2%, uh, is 13.4 years. Not too bad. We paid that off a little quicker. Uh, we did have a loan on it, so that extends it out a little bit, but we paid it off pretty quickly. And now that's just money in our pocket. Um, so it really can actually work for the finances of the business as well. Um, and I kind of, um, as to, to wrap this up, I kind of want to give a shout out to uh, Michigan Saves and also uh, PACE, uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, Without Michigan Saves, we would probably still be in much the same uh, uh, situation that we were before. The Michigan Saves alone allowed us to move this project forward by several years and allowed us to fix uh, the deficiencies of the building that were real problems uh, while we were addressing energy concerns. In fact, we probably would have had to just replace the roof without doing anything else if it came down to the uh, not being able to get a loan for that work. Uh, similarly, uh, you can do a lot of things with PACE financing. 
Um, this is only for commercial buildings at this point, but um, I, I look forward to that that being expanded across the United States. I would love to see it for residential homes as well. Uh, so these programs are important. It's a first step in, in terms of how we get to the financing that's going to be needed to do these types of projects. So that is the end of my presentation. Doug, thank you so much. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, what would be a good way to get the building owner to how to approach them for retrofitting an existing building? Um, right. So in my opinion, when you're thinking about an existing building, the first thing you can do and the best thing you can do is gather some data. Um, data will be critical to making good decisions. So uh, energy audits or uh, there are many companies out there that will kind of, um, you know, do some diagnostic testing in a building and figure out what you got going on. Um, I uh, think that that's probably your first step. Um, another really great thing, though, that I think is underrepresented is, is actually measuring what your circuits are using in the in the building. Um, we, as we found out with the well, there were actually several circuits in our building that were um, not useful to us in any way. They weren't contributing to the overall of the building performance at all, or giving us any benefit. And yet they were just sucking electricity, and some of them were all the time, just like the well was. So. Um, uh, if I took the, all of those circuits combined, um, that was almost the entirety of our solar production, if you can believe that. So by tackling those issues, uh, uh, we were able to, to, make, to make the rest of the retrofit really shine. And I would, add, I would posit that most buildings are going to have um, a lot of wasted energy in areas that, that um, you know, people really just don't know about because it's invisible to them. Sure. Um, so that's number one, it's good diagnostic testing. Number two, start out with the building envelope and then whether you're building new or retrofitting that is the most important thing to get right your building envelope is where it all happens if you get that right you're automatically reducing up to 50 percent of your energy use right there um, so well uh well insulated and airtight buildings are uh much much easier to to uh, to work with um and they re re require a lot less backflips going forward they also allow us to move into all electric heating systems uh, and things like that, which are significantly, um, maybe not more, maybe not more cost effective in the end of the day, or slightly, but um, uh, because electricity costs more than natural gas now, but they, uh, so they will be a, a small um, economic benefit there. But um, the bigger thing is that they're just so much more efficient than any kind of natural gas appliances. So, um, uh, so, so look at uh, that making that building envelope as tight and well insulated as it can be. Then look to heat pumps uh, for not only your heating and cooling, but also your hot water. And um, from there, we kind of go through stepwise in terms of what the building has. I mean, LED lighting is kind of a given at this point. Um, and there's really no reason not to install things like that these days. They, they save so much more than, uh, than what it costs over the long term. And, um, and then so just kind of stepping through a lot of little things, I call it the 2% solution because there's a ton of things in buildings that use like one or 2% more than they need to, or you can save that amount. But if you aggregate them, that's a lot of energy overall. Um, so that's a good way to approach a building, whether you're retrofitting or, or building new. Retrofitting is more difficult because you have to deal with the existing structure and you can't just wholesale rebuild it. But if you're building new, boy, you, you should be going for the best building envelope that you can get and the best heating and cooling system you can get. And if you do that right, you'll be a good share of the way along the, along the way. And what is like the added cost of going carbon neutral versus living building challenge passive house? Right. Um, okay. So a good example is the roofing on that uh, that apartment building that I showed you. Um, because it's living building challenge, I cannot use an asphalt roof. Um, and so um, what we have to do is as a metal roof or something along those lines. Uh, okay, well that is uh, technically, I would say that that's a cost that I have to bear um, uh, to be in that program, but I don't need that to make a carbon neutral building. Um, so if I was to take all the things that make this go to that what I would I'd have to do to uh, to make that building carbon neutral? Let's say the building costs two million. I'm probably adding about another two hundred to three hundred thousand in cost to make that go carbon neutral and net zero energy. Uh, by going to uh, by going to living building challenge, I'm probably adding about another three hundred thousand in total costs. So the first three hundred thousand, I can make an economic argument for that all day, any day. 
uh, there's a financing issue there, but uh, but the economic ar argument long term is 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 pretty solid. Uh, going to living building challenge uh, and all of the the biophilia and things like that harder to make an economic argument for, but you can make an argument that boy we have to have living ecosystems on our planet or or you know we're we're going to be in the same sort of uh, milieu of what's happening with climate change, just on a little bit more of a slow moving item. We have to be concerned about the biodiversity. We have to be concerned about toxics in our in our environment. So, uh, you know, there's no financial model for that, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned with it. Right, exactly. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Hi, Matt, you're Hi. up next. <laughs> How is everybody? So um, thanks, y'all. And uh, on that note, while I'm pulling this up, um, uh, you know, Doug was talking about the financial case for this, and I was on a, uh, a a a panel about a month ago where somebody had asked the question, you know, if we can make the business case for sustainability, and I offered the counter question, can you make the business case for unsustainability? Uh, so. Um, yeah, so when we're thinking about these costs, we really do need to look at the the holistic picture of all this. So again, I'm Matt Grokoff with the Thrive Collaborative, uh, the founder of this, and we're working on this extraordinary project called Viridian at County Farm. And so really what we're all talking about today is really how do we create a future that doesn't suck completely? Um, but even beyond that, really, how do we make one that's that's really beautiful? So in the middle of these two profound crises, and there is this kind of awakening right now uh, that is happening that is as uh, as frightening as it is there's also some extraordinarily beautiful things that are happening um, and we all kind of know what those are in our private lives everything from being able to hear the sounds of birds downtown um, to being able to spend more time with our family for for better or worse um, uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, last year I've got I have to brag and this is the one thing I really brag about uh, I I, I uh, it was sp spent some time in Sweden last year, um, and uh, I happened to be there uh, on the same day as the first global climate strike, and was able to spend the morning with uh, all the original strikers, um, uh, the Fridays for Future strikers, with Greta Thunberg. Uh, and this little woman was extraordinary and had a profound impact on my life. Um, I haven't booked any flights since that time. COVID's made that easier for me but um, also just kind of expanded the commitment of what action looks like. So I'm gonna let her speak for a minute. This is the end of her TED talk from now, uh, last year. Now at the end of my talk. And this is where people usually, people usually start talking about hope, solar panels, wind power, circular economy, and so on. But I'm not going to do that. We've had 30 years of pep talking and selling positive ideas. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. Because if it would have, the emissions would have gone down by now. They haven't. And yes, we do need hope. Of course we do. But the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then, and only then, hope will come. And that is the biggest takeaway that I had from her, and to this day, is hope is something we earn. So we can, uh, I heard someone say, I believe it was Jason McClendon from the Living Future Institute, that all of these pledges, pledges alone, are vanity. Um, so we can't just pledge to do these things. So let's uh, zoom out a little bit and take a look at this bigger picture. This is uh, the picture of uh, uh, extraordinary, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, if you look really closely, there's uh, Ann Arbor over there on the left, uh, right there on that little pale blue dot that Carl Sagan called planet Earth. And just over there, there's Jan Culbertson's closet office if you zoom in really, really closely. Um, but uh, uh, so I, a, a couple of years ago, I took my daughters out of school to see the Falcon Heavy rocket launch for the first time. And my little four-year-old daughter at the time looked up when she saw this image of Starman and saw planet Earth behind. She goes, oh, that's where we live. And I said, yeah, that's where, where everybody lives. And she just smiled at me and she said, yes, we share it. And so this profound statement by this little girl uh, is something that we all really miss. 
And this is something, so my, my older daughter, uh, who was uh, uh, 10 years old at the time, her teacher asked her um, to, uh, her and her classmates, to write down on a note card what they wish their superpower could be. And you can imagine what a what, what fifth graders would say, right? You know, fly, invisibility, all the things. But this is what my daughter said. To snap my fingers and climate change is over. Why? Because it's hard to do yourself. This is the profound thing. This is the kind of world that we're leaving to our children, right? We're designing everything from Google satellite maps. And we're not getting down onto the ground and seeing how things are designed on an adjacent level. This was a slide that I put together before a talk that I gave in Verona, Italy. Um, uh, sadly, I, I thought the map on the left was Verona. It turned out it was actually Venice. But the point is exactly the same. This was a city on the left that was, uh, that was created when organically from the bottom up, before there were Caterpillar tractors, before there was Google satellite maps. And on the right side, it's the organic structure of a leaf. And both have the same bottom-up organic structure that happens always when things are emergent, um, when they obey the rules, the simple rules for local interaction. And so we have to get back to this notion on the right side of the screen of the, of the leaf. And on the left, where humans uh, you know, obeyed those same rules that nature did and didn't sever the fractal relationship that we had with the land and with nature. So we have to find a way to, uh, you know, how do we make not just buildings, but communities that are ecologically restorative, socially just, and culturally rich. So let me give you go back a little bit in history here. So uh, this is the house that I live in. This was a photograph that was taken in 1913. That is actually the Gauss family in front of the house uh, about uh, eight years before Gertrude Gauss was born, the woman that we bought this house from. Uh, the house was built in 1901. This is what it looked like on the day that we moved in, uh, or the day we looked at it in July of 2006. It had everything you could ever want, you know, asbestos siding, lead paint, um, but we saw this wonderful south facing roof and we said um, we were going to make the commitment that this house was going to be harvest all of the energy it needed. It was going to harvest all the water that it needed and it was going to be zero waste and restorative for the community. So not just a harm avoidance, but actually restorative. And we pledged all this because we didn't know that it wasn't possible. Um, and we uh, restored the house. We won all kinds of preserva historic preservation awards. We, uh, we uh, took that gas line and we removed it um, uh, and became one of the earlier all electric homes. Um, we're still one of the few all electric homes on the old west side historic district of Ann Arbor. And in 2014, we were able to certify the house through the Living Building Challenge for, uh, for net zero energy. And we remain, uh, sadly, the oldest structure uh, in North America to be certified as net zero energy. Um, there are a couple of others in the pipeline that we hope will, uh, will beat us. And this was on the second day of spring, the first day of spring, my daughter Dahlia was born and uh, in 2014. And we came home and there was a uh, a check from the utility company for $500 for all the renewable energy credits that we harvested. And we realized on that day that my daughters were growing up in a home that they didn't know, they'll never know what it was like to grow up in one that would consume carbon. Uh, so my mother, my grand, uh, my mother-in-law calls her the, uh, the, the net zero baby. And because of this house and the extraordinary things it achieved, it was on the cover of several books. Uh, it's been in over a, a 200 different publications. It's my daughter reading one on the potty when she was younger in solar today. Uh, this was, I got to talk about it last year when I was in Croatia on Good Morning Croatia. Yes, it's, it's a real show. And uh, uh, this was the most flattering thing anybody called me. They called me the, the proven uh, zero energy master. Um, and USA Today named it one of the best green homes in America, and uh, the Atlantic called it sustainable perfection. This is the point where everybody in the audience applauds. But the, the secret is, is that's kind of all BS. Um, uh, there's no such thing as a sustainable building. We can try our best, but there's no such thing as a sustainable anything. Um, all of life depends on mutual networks that are emergent from the bottom up. 
um, they don't sustain themselves on them by themselves. They sustain themselves by being mutually beneficial and restorative. So they create the conditions. Each organism creates the conditions that are conducive to life, not just for itself, but for others. And then it replicates and new life emerges. So the question is, how do we do that in the human built environment? So we have to ask this question, um, uh, you know, how do we scale that and become a world of living communities? And so this, I'm gonna play a, a short video about um, uh, the project we're working on here in Ann Arbor. Hi, I'm Matt Grokoff, the founding partner of the Thrive Collaborative. It's our mission to accelerate the transformation to a truly sustainable human built environment that is nature rich and ecologically restorative. We're planting Viridian adjacent to County Farm Park, nestled between 130 acres of woods, wildflower lined trails, community gardens and playgrounds. We're targeting it to be one of the nation's first mixed income net zero energy communities. And we're creating one of the world's first living community challenge master plans, often called the most rigorous and inspiring green building standard. Viridian and County Farm is expected to be a 100% all electric development powered by solar with no gas lines or combustion appliances of any kind. Front porches facing greenways are planned to connect you into miles of wooded trails. Our landscaping is viewed as a means of reviving ecosystems and 30% is dedicated for food production like edible plant gardens and streets lined with fruit trees. And plans for your neighborhood include a multi-purpose community barn, a greenhouse, and a farmhouse with a full-service farm stop grocery where you can buy local food from local farmers year-round. To make bike ownership easy, we plan a four-season bike maintenance and repair shed. Ann Arbor has been called the best place to live in America. Viridian is located near downtown Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan, and world-class research hospitals. It's just steps away from the Mary Lou Murray Recreation Center and a short walk to a farmer's market, organic groceries, dozens of restaurants, shops, bookstores, and conveniences. Using human-scale design, plans for the site include a variety of market-rate housing types and 50 units of affordable housing through our collaboration with a local nonprofit supportive housing provider. The land had been owned by Washtenaw County since 1836 and was used for over a century as the county poor farm. In the 1960s, they built a youth prison, which was later abandoned and then demolished. In 2018, Washtenaw County unanimously approved the sale of the property for the development of Viridian and County Farm. We will not be defined by the unsparing consequences of climate change, but by how we respond as the window for opportunity for action closes. Now is a time to invest in the positive solutions demanded by climate crisis. Now is a time for a world of living communities. Visit viridianacountyfarm.com to learn more about investing in this extraordinary neighborhood or purchasing a home of your own. So uh, obviously we're not doing this alone. We've got uh, lots of collaborators and this is how something like this is possible. And here's kind of an overview of, of the neighborhood that's really dynamic and trying to include all of these different things in here. Um, uh, we were recently highlighted by the uh, uh, United Nations at the World Urban Forum in Abu Dhabi for uh, ha having a plan that meets the sustainable development goals and being kind of a model for how we can roll this out and scale this. Um, the framework that we're using for this in order to get to these really ambitious goals is the Living Community Challenge. And we're one of the Living Community Challenge pilot projects. And the Living Future Institute uses this metaphor of a forest. Whereas, you know, buildings and communities are rooted in place, and yet they're, they're unique to each place, right? You don't put a Segoro cactus in Ann Arbor, and you don't put a Baroque tree in the Sonoran Desert. They're adapted to the climate and the site. They're, they harvest all of their own energy and all of their own water. A tree can't go across the street for more energy or water. It's got to be able to do it where it stands. It promotes well-being. There's no such thing as waste. Waste is a resource for itself or something else. And the relationships are symbiotic. They have part of integrated systems. And diversity is essential in any complex adaptive ecosystem. You don't have complex adaptivity without that kind of diversity. And uh, the thing I love most about Living Building Challenge is that beauty is actually a required element um, and education as well. 
So these are the imper imperatives of the living community challenge. Um, uh, place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. And I do want to emphasize that equity is a big part of this. And, um, and I personally believe that, uh, that equity is a precondition to sustainability. If we don't have that, uh, there's no way that we can actually transform the human built environment to, uh, to, to, to meet the demands of climate crisis. So with place, um, first is limits to growth. Stop building in areas that haven't already been built. We picked a site where there was a former youth prison. Um, urban agriculture, let's start growing as much food as we possibly can directly where we're consuming that food uh, and preserve uh, agriculture land. Uh, we're doing a farmhouse with a grocery store, as you heard in the little video. Um, habitat exchange. We need to stop building on places that uh, we haven't built on and restore the places that we've already built on. So any place that we that we've we've developed enough of the planet uh, uh, to to build on and build on again on. The rest of that is preserving land outside. So we'll be doing a habitat exchange and purchasing the equivalent amount of land that we're developing on to save somewhere else uh, some sensitive habitat that's uh, at risk of destruction. Um, really focusing on human powered living, uh, uh, EV bike sharing, uh, EV car sharing. So the neighborhood will be uh, not only harvesting energy, but using electricity to power its vehicles and every home will come from day one with an electric car. Um, I'm sorry, with an electric car charger. Uh, all the front porches create a greenway connection to bring people down to the human scale. And the landscaping, again, is a, is a means of reviving those eco ecosystems. Energy, uh, we're targeting net zero energy for the entire building site-wide. We, through our purchase agreement with, the, uh, with Washington County, we promise to do a minimum of 400 kW. Uh, more likely, we're going to be able to get to uh, uh, over a megawatt of energy. Um, but it's not just about how much energy you can produce. It's about creating resiliency. So one of the things everyone fears is storms and terrorists, right? The terrorists are going to knock out the grid. The Russians are going to knock out the grid. So far, the biggest problem is this thing. Uh, the technical term is POCBS. I promise you, you can Google this. I can't make this stuff up. But uh, it's power outages caused by squirrels. Um, uh, these little creatures should really prove the lack of resiliency in our in our current grid. So we have to recreate the grid and we have to have solar plus storage and demand response and all these other dynamic ways of making electrons uh, more democratic and flow in multiple directions. So this is our solar study of the site. So the north side of the site where you see no solar on there is actually Avalon housing. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to explain a little bit more about that in the Q and A afterwards. But just on the rooftops that you see, and again, this is just rooftops alone. Um, and we can add some solar carports and things in there as well on some of the parking space that we have. We can produce about 1.3 megawatts of energy annually. That's a huge amount of production. Um, uh, and we can do that in the current regulatory framework by doing this on individual rooftops and basically privatizing each one of those uh, uh, energy production houses. Um, and we can put battery packs in each of the houses and we have these wonderful little resilient nano grids that are privatized by the, by the owner. Uh, that's not the goal that we're trying to achieve. So now up here, uh, this is the uh, Avalon uh, housing uh, uh, community building, which is registered as a living building challenge pilot project um, uh, for affordable housing. Uh, it, it will be able to harvest some solar, but the rest of it through mechanisms we can explain later, um, they can't, there's no regulatory mechanism that allows solar on multifamily housing in the way that they set up their multifamily housing. Um, so you have this zero production of kilowatt hours here and the lights off during a storm, whereas during a, uh, a, a power outage, uh, all of the market rate homes would have the lights on. Uh, and this creates a huge, huge inequity. Um, we will be meeting with DTE next week to talk about doing a microgrid. Uh, net positive water, really using rainwater as an asset. So we've got a dynamic plan for, for green infrastructure, health and happiness. Again, as a symbiotic relationship, we don't look at streets and roofs and alleyways 
and viaducts and parks as single use things. They have, they can have multiple purposes. So you create this synergist, synergistic infrastructure. So this is a lot of what um, uh, uh, Viridian will look like. Um, materials, we'll be building uh, these homes in our sister company, um, Big Block, that we're creating. Um, uh, that will be bringing the materials, healthy materials inside of this factory. So we're able to know where, what forests they're coming from. Does do these things have toxic materials and creating a, a healthier environment for workers by building inside. And, uh, and then in the operations of the building, creating a living materials plan, we'll have different zones for materials and have co a compulsory uh, composting on site. And from materials themselves, really reusing materials throughout the site. And our community center will be made from a restored barn um, that will be nearby. And again, equity is a really big component of this using layered spaces, a set accessible and adaptable design. That's a closet that can be adapted to a elevator shaft. So all the closets in our homes are stacked one on top of another. So if you ever need it, you can put in a, uh, an elevator shaft and beauty. And of course, what we build here, what we build anywhere, what we choose to build is going to define us for the next thousand years. Uh, and we've got a very short amount of time to do that. So my daughter, uh, you know, if she's fortunate enough to live to 100, which there's a good chance she will, she'll still be alive in the year 2114. That's astonishing to think about. When I saw that date, I literally had to pull out a calculator and say, I must be wrong. Nobody I know is going to be alive in 2114. So when we talk about the year 2030 and 2050 as these goals, or the year 2100, these are not way off things. This is my daughter we're talking about here. But these are the things that are possible. This is the home that we started with, and this is the home that they're living with on the right. Um, this is the bullet center in Seattle. It harvests all of its own water that it needs for the building. There's no sewer connections. Uh, uh, there's just nutrient recovery that comes out of that building. Um, it harvests all of its own energy on site. Uh, this is the same thing. This is the uh, Omega Institute, fully certified living building challenge building in Rhinebeck, New York. Um, uh, not only is this their yoga studio because it's so beautiful, uh, but that's just a symbiotic purpose. The primary function of this building is its sewage treatment plant, um, which is a misnomer because it's not sewage, it's actually a nutrient. Uh, all the nutrients that are coming out of the toilets go into growing tropical plants inside of this building. So it's an extraordinary thing. So I'll leave y'all with this and let's, and looking forward to a really exciting uh, dialogue in just a minute. But this is one of my favorite poems from the poet Wendell Berry in The Peace of Wild Things because even the other night I was up, uh, uh, thinking about these issues. Um, when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and I lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. And I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water. And I feel above me the daylight stars, the day blind stars waiting for their light. And for a time, I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. So. Thank you, Matt. So we had one comment in the comment section. It wasn't really a question, but Patricia Watt says 30 years of pep talking, bingo. Yep. No more pep talking. Um, I do like to inspire. We like to, we want to, you know, part of the thing is, is um, uh, I, I think Doug actually mentioned Saul Griffith. So that quote about creating a future that doesn't suck actually comes from Saul Griffith. He says that the, 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 the challenge for all of us is, is frankly a lack of imagination right? We keep talking about all these negative things that are going to happen, what, you know, the world, what it's going to be like if we don't. And that's a wonderful behavioral economics thing for the brain to fear the future so that we'll, we won't make those mistakes. But at the same time, it's really important to keep at the forefront that it's going to be fucking great. <laughs> it's going to be 
<laughs> it's really going to be beautiful. And that's what we need to emphasize. And that's what I tell my girls all the time. And they're, they have the privilege of witnessing that every day of going out to one of the rain gardens like Meadowlark has in front of their building and, and seeing species of butterflies that didn't come to this property before we built those rain gardens. Um, uh, you know, so those little daily things, it, it, it's extraordinary. And you can imagine living at Viridian and being able to walk out your front door and pick fruit off of a tree and see birds and see your neighbors and live among people that recently experienced homeless homelessness. And you don't have the opportunity unless you design these beautiful things um, from, from, from the very beginning. And again, from, from the bottom up, not from the top down. Right. Well, can you tell us more about the energy, democracy, and equality of renewable energy? That's a great question. And that's one I would have asked myself. <laughs> um, uh, Y'all, we wrote these questions. If you're not asking questions on Facebook, we're going to ask you, we're going to ask our own. So, uh, uh, but- Give yeah. it away, give it away. <laughs> <laughs> give away our backstage secrets. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, though, it's uh, it, it, it's you know th this whole thing we really should be talking about energy equity. Um, what's happening out in California right now is they've experienced all kinds of natural disasters. You know, we all know about the fires right. uh, and what's happening to the electrical grid and the number of power outages that they have there um, because of this lack of resiliency and this reliance on this 100 year old grid. So what we have is tons of people putting solar panels up. It's great. That's not the solution. Most of that energy is complicated to explain, but actually gets curtailed because if you're not using that energy at the brightest time of day, that's all going to the grid. But the power company then has to take that same amount of energy that's being produced by renewable energy and, and lower what's coming out of the gas fired power plant, but they can't do that quick enough. So, uh, so that energy gets curtailed. So what's happening is we've got wealthy people putting up solar panels, putting battery packs in. We have, we haven't paid a utility bill since, um, 2011. Wow. We've had negative utility bills. So, uh, that's great for me, <laughs> That's a, but it's not mutually beneficial. And the electrons I'm producing aren't beneficial to the grid. And it really doesn't help the utility company or the community. So what's needed is a more modernized grid and, uh, and um, microgrids. So we've been really, really fortunate um, that, uh, uh, that, that there's, there, there is this new awakening among everyone. Um, We've had conversations with the governor's office and the Michigan Public Service Commission and with DTE uh, and the University of Michigan and some other partners about what we can do at Viridian to create this model of, of resiliency and energy democracy. And by making this a microgrid, um, we can work with DTE to make this an energy resource for them, not just a burden where they lose customers, but something that everyone in the neighborhood has the same benefits of battery packs and renewable energy and clean air and all the and and and, and lower electrical bills because of that. Um, what we have right now under the current framework is 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 two separate entities in the same neighborhood. One, people who've recently experienced homelessness, supported by a supportive housing organization, and the other market rate. And you, you're, you're, you're seeing the differences in stark terms right there if we don't change this model. So we're working really, really hard to change that model and see what we can do to get a microgrid. So um, uh, stay tuned. Um, it could be really, really cool. Um, we have more than a 50% chance of making this a reality. Um, if we aren't able to do that right out of the gate, the entire neighborhood is all electric and designed to be adapted to that. So if we can do this in three years from now, we can still make it happen. So at some point, this will be a 100% renewable energy powered community with resiliency as a, as a microgrid that's beneficial to the macro grid. We talked about it going electric. So would it, you know, with being all electric, the cost, you know, is it more expensive? What does it cost for the developer? I'm sure that's something else that like with everybody else that you're talking about yeah. too. Yeah. One of the important things. There, there's great data on this now, um, and uh, and we can share this with you. And I think Doug would probably agree. 
from, uh, from a construction point of view on new construction, listen to me, people, everybody out there, it is cheaper to build all electric. I heard great news yesterday because I've been advocating for all electric for a, over a decade now that a new neighborhood uh, that is soon to be approved here in Ann Arbor uh, that a developer is doing uh, near the University of Michigan uh, is going to be all electric because folks on the planning commission and people at the city encourage them to do so. And when they looked at the numbers, I haven't spoken to them yet, but I presume they were like, hey, it's cheaper. Yeah. yeah, of course we're going to go all electric, um, and uh, and again, it's really just changing the way of thinking. It's it's not this isn't rocket science anymore. Um, like Doug said, it's uh, heat pumps of all kinds. So heat pump clothes dryers, heat pump uh, uh, water heaters, heat pump furnaces, so geothermal or air source heat pumps. Um, while individually those things might be more expensive, like geothermal or a heat pump is going to be more expensive than a conventional system. However, holistically, it's, it's less expensive to install all these things and avoid having to put in gas infrastructure into a brand new building or a neighborhood. Right. Um, so it's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. It is. Well, thank you so much, Matt. We're going to turn it over to Katrina now. Katrina, I'm just gonna give you, yeah, we couldn't hear you, try again. Terrific. Well, thanks so much for having me today um, and bearing with us as we navigate this world of doing online presentations. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me and I've never gotten to speak of in front of before, I'm sort of a, an old school professor in, in kind of a new school type of format. So um, I'm used to being in front of people and kind of walking around and talking with my hands as we go through these. So different format for me today. But nonetheless, it was really exciting to be here today and to get to talk about the opportunity of Yes We Can. Um, being located here in Gasland, at times we can we kind of hear the conversation, no, but it's tricky. And here a lot of the conversations pointed to the broader economic challenges that are associated with decarbonization. So as an economist and someone who's um, been located within electrical engineering for kind of the duration of my career, I'm gonna talk about really the opportunities that we have to really scale beyond buildings and, and build off of some of the conversations um, that Matt was alluding to about just what we can do to take critical action today to make the goals that we need to in the time we can. Um, so just quick points about us at Smith Group. Um, we're located right in Michigan. So even though, as I said, I'm right here in our Pittsburgh office today, I'm doing tons of work with my colleagues who are located in Detroit, um, in Ann Arbor, but also my colleagues who are located in Madison, Milwaukee. So I'm right around the corner. I'm someone who tends to describe myself as a recovering academic, if you will. I've only joined Smith Group about a year ago. Um, and I was really choosy about what company I chose and how I could really come to a firm and really create concrete action. Smith Group has a really strong uh, legacy of sustainability and it was kind of a hands down choice for me to go and work with a company who really has been at the forefront of working with AIA to, to really help create what kind of our uh, decarbonization goals should be from a building sector. So um, at Smith Group, the, one of the things that I joined to, as I said, is to build off that tradition of already having a net zero energy projects. We're really proud that we completed the first kind of triple lead platinum project, um, that we've really worked on some cool buildings like the Brock Environmental Center. If you haven't seen it, I would Google it but also in kind of uh, expanding beyond buildings and really taking the lead on helping university campuses be proactive in their sustainability designs. I joined though with a heart of resilience. So I was really excited to hear uh, the previous presenters allude to the need to really think critically about adaptation today. Although decarbonization is a long-term goal at the fundamental core work that I really am looking at today is actually what can we do in about the eight years we have left to actually avoid the catastrophic impacts of climate change. Um, this chart is one of the first ones that I had the pleasure of working on uh, post PhD, which actually looked at 
what does it mean that we need to be preparing for now? Um, a fun fact about these kind of long-term climate goals is they were created at a time whenever we thought we had 50 years, et cetera. As we alluded to, a lot of those discussions started in 1980 and kind of used the future 2030, 2050 as you know a ballpark um, deadline that was much farther out. Unfortunately, the world that we're living in today looks a lot different from the past. When you look at 1980 up to today, we actually see a 40% increase in the number of worldwide catastrophic events that we're dealing with. So today, as it's important to talk about decarbonization, it's important to talk about decarbonization and these decisions that we're taking in a really systemic viewpoint. How do our buildings help to connect to the broader protection that our communities needs? How can our buildings um, enhance our decarbonization goals? But really, how do we combine these things to create a sustainable, affordable, and really accessible energy future for all? I got into really this business of resilience, actually, from being um, one of these politicians that previous, uh, I guess, um, attendees have bashed, which I totally take on board. It's 100% accurate. Um, I, after my PhD, had the pleasure of working towards the COP um, forum that was located in Paris that really uh, led, as we know, to the, the first global treaty on climate change. Unfortunately for us, with the presidential change less than a year later, um, the US pulled out. Me, at the time, I'm half European, half American. I was located in the UK at the time um, and had done all of my studies in Europe. Um, so I was really kind of someone who took the criticism of Americans deep into my heart and core. And as I was kind of debating, you know, okay, the US is pulling out, what can we actually do to happen? I, by coincidence, ran into the mayor of Pittsburgh in Paris, and he told me um, he was really focused on connecting his efforts that the Green Building Alliance had pushed forward here to broader community resilience within the city of Pittsburgh. So I spent the past four years really working alongside the mayor and the chief resilience officer here to form a treaty with the Danish government that would really help us understand how we can build off of our zero carbon initiative and really scale this up into a decarbonized city. It was a bold, big statement, one that I'm really proud of that we've made here in Pittsburgh. And four years later, actually, from getting Pittsburgh to a, a really solid place um, in our 2030 district here, I've joined Smith Group to really make sure that we carry forth the same tangible action to other communities. I could have asked for a better hype man, if you will, than Matt, who just went before me, um, because he alluded to the real crux of what we need to do today. And what I really work on at Smith Group is the concept of microgrids. Um, as we talked about, we know that renewable integration is going to happen. But as Matt alluded to, um, what I'm, uh, not just squirrels, if you will, but actually the increasing amount of technology that we're locating within our households. If you think about COVID alone, how much electricity that we're drawing on from our residential units at the moment, not just from being at home, but also from increasing these hot spells. What this means is that our grid is facing more stress than we ever have. In places like Michigan and places like Pennsylvania and West Virginia and in Ohio, what we're also facing is an industrialized legacy that we're dealing with. In Pittsburgh here, for instance, um, our utility that we work with here is one of the first in the United States and originated out of the Westinghouse era. But a lot of the grid attention that has um, been taken throughout the years and the real focus on what we want the grid to do from a regulatory standpoint has been slightly incremental since the first really big innovations that we had over 100 years ago. Microgrids to me are a really opportunity to use electricity as the foundations to reindustrialize, if you will. Um, in, back in the kind of olden, I guess, mid, you'd say late 1800s, early 1900s, when we really started building these grids and you look at cities like Pittsburgh and you look at cities like Detroit, the reason that we installed electrification is because we were hardcore industrial centers. We had places like Ford who were at the heart of our city who were really um, using electricity to create automobiles, right? In Pittsburgh, we had the same thing, but for, for the steel industry. Today, as more and more people are moving towards urban settings, I have this ethos, if you will, and Smith Group, uh, we're really excited to be acting on this specifically in California and in a couple projects here locally. But we really have um, an understanding and an appreciation that microgrids can be more than just electrical infrastructures, if, if you will. If we really think tangibly about what our utility infrastructure needs, what our broader communities need, and actually what type of economic development we're causing, um, specifically in these tech towns where we see data centers coming into place, we can really take advantage of um, new built designs 
and even adaptive reuse situations to really think about how buildings themselves can really act as catalysts to change in our communities. In Pittsburgh, we have a plan for how we're doing this. Um, the University of Pittsburgh, where I'm still a professor, and actually the National Energy Technologies Laboratory worked for a few years to really develop what we call the grid of microgrids here. Um, we've identified areas, if you will, that kind of uh, showed up in my previous research here, where we really understood where kind of um, the affordability of electricity supplies, supplies for vulnerable communities were happening where the stress in our grid um, when looking at kind of uh, power outages was happening. And then specifically in working with Department of Homeland Security to understand um, where the actual physical vulnerabilities of our grid needed to be occurring. We were able to identify actually what we're calling these hot spots for energy innovation, if you will. Not pointing to just buildings that need to decarbonize, but pointing to actual whole neighborhoods that would help the city reduce our energy that would help um, the building owners themselves contribute in economies of scale savings behind district shared systems, but also in looking at where are these places that need to provide strategic protection to our communities in the instance of disasters. Today, we're proud to be embarking and going down um, the, the more conventional understanding of what these microgrids need to look at and exploring a lot of the regulatory obstacles that stand in the way from um, utilities being able to participate in that two-way power flow future that Matt had talked about previously. So this is kind of my ethos, if you will. Um, we have a plan and a vision here in Pittsburgh and it's hard. Um, and as everyone alluded to, we kind of have a small amount of time left to really make the change that we need. But if we really think about it, take the kind of politics out of it and the policy out of it, I think today's ethos about yes, we can is a really positive reminder that we in the construction and especially in architectural and engineering industry have a critical role in actually acting as a bit of the shadow governments, if you will. Even though we don't have those top-down frameworks for excellence that we need to achieve to, we do have standards that can help steer our projects toward excellence, like the Living Futures Initiative, like things like LEED Platinum. But what we can also do is just work with our building owners themselves and work with our neighborhoods and districts to really seek that intentional commonality that can help us to achieve those goals no matter what. I tend to talk about scales of influence at all times. To me, I'm a systems person and um, someone who works in the physical realm. So thinking about buildings and kind of where they connect um, to other levels is something that I need to do because methodologically, I tend to work in wires, if you will. So if we think about buildings as being just that connection to the neighborhoods and districts, those neighborhoods and districts fitting within cities that fit within states, that fit within regions and fit within national goals, we can kind of proactively urge um, a bottom-up contribution to climate change that honestly hasn't necessarily been seen before. Um, as someone who spent more than 10 years of, of the initial part of my career working in Europe, um, we did decarbonize really quickly, especially in Germany and especially in the UK. Um, but one thing that happened there over and over again is the affordability question. No country in the world out of the 192 that signed on to the Paris Agreement have been able to truly solve the problem of affordability. And the United States as well, something that we need to take and, and really embrace and consider right now is vulnerable communities are the ones who pay the most for their utility bills. So if we really think about buildings as being able to spread themselves out as being able to act as that catalyst to change the communities, some of the, the cheaper power solutions that we're seeing through renewable integration that my previous colleagues alluded to is something that can also help to reduce the utility burden on our most vulnerable populations. And what we can do there is free up a portion of wealth. And that's exciting because what we know from the past few months is that we need to make much better and much more actionable strides on equity now than we have at any other time. So what you do in government by setting out this framework, if you will, whenever you're working in a regional pattern is by creating those goals and those targets, but most importantly, the missing obstacle and the pathways. This is something that I'm doing all over the place with not just building clients, but neighborhood clients and actually with city scale clients. Um, I'll give more practical examples of that later in the presentation. But I think what we really see here is that this opportunity to focus on the last um, bubble here, the steps and changes in your growth path that you're going to take to achieve those goals and targets for 2030, 2050 can really help you understand and intentionally dissect what actions you need to take in the future. There's a variety of tools that we can take advantage of that, tend, that we tend to limit ourselves in the design community about. There are not just um, kind of tax incentives that we can take place from, but there is a certain risk avoidance that we need to do a better job of educating building owners on. 
um, in places like where the regional greenhouse gas initiative is soon going to be coming into place or is already operating. We want to ensure and remind building owners, developers, and even broader um, neighborhood planners that the future is coming and the penalty for carbonization will be coming too. The cheapest thing that you can do right now is to be proactive on decarbonization. It's a risk avoidance mechanism and one that should be talked about more and more and more. Climate change just isn't an environmental strategy, it's a financial risk mitigation strategy. So I'm gonna fast forward to some of these things. Let's talk about the economics of this because at the, at the end of the day, um, my real true passion comes in showing the economic benefits of our sustainable design. As we've talked about previously, you can save tons of uh, money from using these renewable energy systems. But one thing that I like to point out to and that I consider a little point of pride and also passion, if you will, is really quantitatively pointing to all of the plus and all of the wins that you will experience through incorporating sustainable design features. This doesn't even include the economies of scale savings that you get from going beyond building systems. But we know that sustainability have quantitative positive, positive impacts that can and should be can, um, captured on your financial statements that go much more beyond kind of the triple bottom line role that we apply to now. So uh, I think what we really need to do kind of in the future and going forward to connect these regional strategies is embrace that we ourselves in the design community are kind of the leaders of change that we need to be. I think what we really need to be focusing on is where are these hot spots for innovation and decarbonization, if you will? Where are the economic needs that we have from a broader uh, community development need, but also from an economic development need? One thing that I learned from in Pittsburgh is that we need to be proactive for these Amazons to come here, if we will. We need to have a zero carbon grid ready. We need to have zero carbon buildings ready. And we need to really have flexible workspaces and flexible transportation systems. Um, this is what economic development today requires. So again, we can think about climate change as a real strategy for how we create positive financial um, incentives in place. Um, one thing, I'm going to skip through a lot of these because like usual, again, being a professor, one thing that happens is you always go heavy at the beginning and light at the end. But one thing that um, I just want to point out to here that's a little bit is, is what you can do even beyond renewable energy for a cost savings benefit. Um, when looking at the renewable installations that we've talked about here in a little bit from a microgrid design standpoint, what we can actually see is that actually there's a deep need to also offset, offset the impact of the grid in places. So specifically in Michigan right now, when you're talking about DTE, there's a real need to mesh together these utility worlds. And there's a real need for, for buildings, I think, to be the catalyst in making those discussions. Buildings have heavy load profiles, so they can really form a united agreement between the world of the grid and the world of policy demands, if you will. Whenever people say, you know, we really need to crack the finances on it, I kind of take it as a personal challenge, but a point of excitement, if you will. There's tons of financial measures, tools, instruments, and even mechanisms that you can pull to solve the gap for the developer that you're working with, whether it's in a building perspective or even on a large scale policy perspective. For those of you who are located in kind of disaster territories um, labeled as X from FEMA, note that you can actually use grants to also pay for that kind of gap in the upfront costs that you experience. But increasingly, over and over and over again, we're seeing that utility costs are increasing, renewables are decreasing, and that actually customers demanding 100% reliability. So being able to prove the cost utilization and, and showing actually building owners that actually, if you're trying to find a hardcore return on your investment, one of the easiest and most risk adverse strategies that you can take right now is focusing on actually a net, uh, net zero energy design. Focusing and showing a building owner, for instance, how they can win the financial benefits from the renewable system lets us to zoom this out then and gain economies of scale savings. I, I know it's a phrase I use constantly, but it's one that I'm really passionate about. If you look at kind of the capabilities of these buildings to be able to expand themselves and really to be able to share between building overs, if you will, that's where you kind of can maximize your energy use because you can also maximize your renewable integrations. You can really be thinking about how you can be conserving across scales in a much larger way. So even though it's exciting to see the leadership that the AIA is taking on kind of uh, the future of decarbonization, if you will, we can really, I think, do even a better job by educating the peers in the areas around us as to how much savings there truly are from taking a more district level approach to decarbonization. 
Of course, as I like to tell people, don't be scared about doing this because we're actually the last place to be looking at how to get this job done, not just because I'm half European. If you go to China right now, um, projects that I am now doing there are, are happening within a year's time. Um, whenever you go to places that have already carbon goals in place, they're already attacking the beast, if you will. Um, we did a design that we were really proud of for a battery storage facility, out of all things, um, in in China and the southeastern provinces. And it was really exciting to see just how quickly um, the Chinese government really embraced being able to take advantage of things, not only like tax incentives, but just the straight up cost of technologies. What we're able to do in places where you're able to create new build is come out of the gates, right? And create these really amazing dynamic city places. And to be honest, as this picture shows, sometimes doing the most sustainable thing is also doing the most innovative thing, but it's also doing the most beautiful thing, which I think is a place where you know we all want to be living someday. So the opportunity, again, to also think at scales is really exciting here because I'm gonna to point to a plan that we're really part of at Smith Group before I end this today. Thinking about decarbonization too is oftentimes a really concrete tool for connecting to other areas of conservation that we're not paying enough attention to. And that area for me really oftentimes tends to be water. Um, we did the, the master plan for the city of Las Vegas where we really focused on understanding what resilience meant for the city of Las Vegas. So understanding their decarbonization was something that this city had done really well. Obviously, you can use tons of solar in Las Vegas. They already have a strong hydro system there. But one thing that they didn't take into account, for instance, was the changing heat patterns and how that was going to affect their long term strategy. What we started noticing was that blackouts were occurring more and more frequently. And this was actually related to the water availability, which is used for cooling purposes uh, within your centralized heating plants but also within your centralized uh, water uh, plants, specifically here in hydro that came from the Hoover Dam. So I think the, the discussion about these circular economies, et cetera, although they did, yes, use indeed be a hype moment, what we're actually seeing in a country as big in the United States is that it's a place that we really have to be intentional about integrating these different strategies straight up into our design policies. By focusing on decarbonization, it allowed us to really focus on understanding actually what our conservation strategies needed to be in water to ensure that our energy supplies were resilient and decarbonized in the long run. And it's not just Las Vegas and places that are hot. It's focusing on this type of dynamic cost benefit analysis for a local utility here has showed us actually that we were able to scale up. Sorry, I'm skipping some slides as I go. That we were really to able to scale up and work with a water utility here and understand what a zero carbon strategy meant for them here. Not only were we able to identify how to save them more than $50,000 a year through a power purchase agreement of over 1.5 megawatt installations of on-site solar, but what we were also able to do was think about how in the future they could take advantage of a future waste um, water treatment facility that's on site and think about how that could be incorporated into a microgrid strategy. And of course, ex expanding its scales here meant that we also were able to identify how to keep that dollar down and how to, uh, how to achieve even greater savings. And what that led us to do is really focus on one of my favorite findings ever, favorite recommendations that I've ever given to a climate client, which is use your bridge. It's reflective. You'll get great sun. It'll be a really strong educational moment. Um, when people say gas is the bridge tool to the future, I like to say that actually, no, it's not solar literally and physically is and point to this project. So I think going forwards, the thing that we need to focus on is, is not just achieving zero, um, zero carbon, which we must do within a very short time period, but also understanding how these strategies can complement things like net zero water, net zero waste, and really be holistic in thinking about not what just our buildings need, but what our communities need. By focusing really on the infrastructures that we need from a social, environmental, and economic perspective, I think we can really take a nice holistic approach approach to decarbonization that lets us build that bottom-up approach to sustainability even when the regional and national policy plans are not in place that we need them to be. Focusing on showing the cost benefits and the, and the positive attributes that come with decarbonization are a really nice grounded method to help um, convince the naysayers, if you will. So going forwards, um, we're really excited about the opportunity to be able to continue to do this at Smith Group and continue to kind of um, expand beyond buildings and really get the world to zero in the short eight years, because it is indeed eight years that we have left. Thank you so much, Katrina. Sure, sorry I went over.
I know. Well, I mean, I think we still have time for a quick question. With the decarbonization and the gas ban in Cal close related in California, how do we see this rolling out in like colder states like Michigan and even like Pittsburgh? I think they're pretty cold too. How do you see that um, kind of going in, in regards to the existing buildings? Yeah, I think it's an opportunity for us to leapfrog here. I know people hate policy words, but it's a policy word that I really like, actually. Um, instead of focusing on just keeping up with the Joneses, if you will, in regards to sustainability, I think it's an, op it's an option right now to think about, OK, how can we learn from other countries and jump ahead? So I think the kind of um, thought about, you know, I think right now there's a tendency to have voting owners specifically looking at CHP because they hear it can cut their carbon intensity straight away. And it's quite cheap right now, if you will, right? But I think that actually what we really could and should be focusing on is actually understanding how buildings can participate in demand response programs uh, directly in, in regards to utility coordination. Yeah. Well, I think that we're going to bring everyone up now. Great. Oh, wait, let me put on that pants. <laughs> first, now, Doug, there we go. And so we did have one question that was for all the presenters from Michael Fisher. And uh, he wanted to know, have you had success in convincing a developer to adopt a more sustainable design construction approach who might have otherwise developed the project in a more conventional way? If so, how? Anybody? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to actually give this a go, but because it's a really quick one. Um, we recently had two big successes that we're super, super proud of at Smith Group. And um, I'm really proud of them because they happened after I joined. So, of course, you know, my one one hundredth of a degree in participation I'm going to exploit today. Um, we've had uh, Virginia Tech Innovation Campuses. Um, we're building the first building that's going to be located there. And we really um, worked with the developers there to showcase them directly in the interview process, the benefits of cost savings that would come from um, the sustainable design that we're taking there, which is actually quite passive design, not just renewable. Um, and then on the other side, uh, I think showing cost benefits in places like California is getting easier by the minute. We have a software we use. If, if other people aren't using it, I super recommend it called Homer that's developed by DOE and NREL. And what we really focus on doing is also capturing kind of the costs of resilience that tend to come with um, the backup generation that you would need in places like San Francisco, if you will. So we've been quite successful in working with healthcare units, specifically in California, to increase their resilience that way. It's always with the money. <laughs> and then yeah. Drew Ross Frank said um, in his comment, please take advantage of utility incentive programs, both commercial and residential. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll add to what, what uh, uh, Katrina was just saying that, uh, and it's not just about the economic stuff that I think is exciting people. People just need to see that it's possible that somebody else is doing it. And you're going to see it snowball. Honestly, don't think it's going to take till 2035 to do a lot of these things. Um, the economics, first of all, is just going to be prohibitive for anyone not to be doing these, I think, very, very shortly. But right when we got Viridian, uh, right when we proposed the project, we started hearing from people in the city of Chattanooga saying, we've got a property just like that. What can we do? And and put me on with their city council. We uh, Yesterday, I was on a call with uh, Barkley Village in uh, Bellingham, Washington, where they're, they're developing 300 acres and uh, have already developed quite a bit of it and said, we've always been wanting to do that, but it looks like you're doing it. What are you doing? And we're saying, we're just, we're just doing it. And so they're going to be doing it. Uh, you've got this all electric development happening here in Ann Arbor, simply because we're doing it. We're showing that it's possible. It's all electric. The city has a goal of decarbonization. And somebody please tell me how you could decarbonize if you're still installing new gas infrastructure. It's impossible. So let's stop that. Nobody on this webinar should ever install gas again. If there's one takeaway from this, go all electric. Everything else will follow after that. We can do microgrids and everything else. So yeah, so I think this really is snowballing and we are able to convince folks to do it. Um, and if they wait to be convinced, they're gonna be a laggard and, uh, and it's gonna be more expensive and it's gonna be tougher for them to do, frankly. Yeah, I just want to give uh, one example of a, a project that we worked on. It was finished in 2008. Um, we 
did at that point in time do a geo exchange system. It was an all electric building. And just this year, they put on their PV system um, and were able to, um, you know, after operating their building, knowing exactly what they needed, uh, be able to size it appropriately um, to um, be net zero. So it can be in multiple steps too. Well, we have another question on here from Awai Shalina. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. And it says, Katrina, you talked about how sustainable design can lead to additional health and wellness benefits. How does this relationship happen? Is this because of an overall healthier environment, taking human health and ergonomics into factor when designing or some other reason? Well, it's a fantastic question. And I think um, the thing that I've learned is each project tends to be unique in the type of benefits that you can construct for it. Um, one thing that I really embrace is the opportunity to almost, um, you know, design the, the building that you want for social purposes as well as for the architectural purposes, if you will. So um, I think from the health benefits, the one thing that you can do is, um, I think Doug specifically referred to it, is really talk about the building envelope and kind of the, the need to source more local materials and that kind of having an indirect benefit if you go through redu reducing things like particulate matter and kind of localized pollu pollution sources. But one thing that you can do is really be proactive on the health side of benefits, if you will, um, in educational institutions especially. It's the area that, sorry, I'm super passionate about, so I always default kind of back to um, campuses. But especially lighting and being proactive in how lighting can enhance mood and you know d directly connect to your reno renewable resources. It's one of the most exciting things I think that's happening in design right now, um, especially whenever you look at just the different types of learning environments that can help be inclusive uh, for different students. And then of course jobs, right? That's the last thing is how can we really identify how these buildings can increase opportunities for learning uh, for those people who need job transitions or even just on-site training, if you will. If I can piggyback on what Katrina said too, um, you know, there's a significant amount of marketing research into um, obviously, you know, the old trope is in that it's true is that people justify purchases or uh, expenditures uh, logically, but they make them emotionally. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of research has gone into what are those, what are those, uh, what are those things that affect people emotionally? And, um, you know, by a factor of 74% to 9%, people react more emotionally to a health message about their personal health or their family's mm -hmm. health than they do to a message about energy efficiency or uh, saving the planet, that type of thing. Why? Because one seems like this huge issue that you might have some sort of an effect on, but it's really small and it's it's uh, it's very vague. Uh, whereas when you talk about your personal health or your children's health, that hits you right there in the heart. And um, and the 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 beautiful thing about it is, if you build for health, you are also building for energy efficiency. And vice versa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, Matt, you took the lead on selling to the audience today, then. Your daughter's talk really hit that on the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, specific things, uh, you know, induction cooktops, you know, things like that. It's like, yes, they're more energy efficient. And yes, they don't contain a poisonous gas that will silently kill your family. They won't explode. Um, so these have health benefits. <laughs> uh, and my daughter's, oddly enough, uh, we went and... Uh, when we go to other people's houses, they say, what's that smell? And it's like, that's a gas stove, honey. Um, oh. <laughs> you, can, you can smell. You, you, you don't realize how much you can sense these things until you don't have it anymore. Yep. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. Can I just one more thing about lighting? Because Katrina mentioned um, so uh, lighting is huge. And just from a, 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 a health perspective, it's one of the most complex and difficult things for people to understand. It's also an equity issue, even in, in the UK right now, they're looking at it and they're realizing that you can identify the wealth of a neighborhood based on its lighting. So you can see that's a poor neighborhood over there when you have this surveillance type lighting that's overlit. Um, and it's gotten worse with the advent of energy efficient lighting because the disparity is greater. So when people aren't, when they're installing LEDs, but they're not paying attention to color temperature, You've got in, uh, impact on health, you've got impact on insects, um, and, and then the wealthy neighborhoods are having more adaptive lighting 
that's more dynamic because the technology is there and we're not doing that in neighborhoods um, with lower incomes. So you end up with this disparity of surveillance lighting versus resort lighting and we need, we need to stop that. Um, and there's an energy efficiency impact as well, of course. So one more thing to add to the complexity of things we all need to pay attention to. <laughs> Well, I just want to kind of piggyback on the health and wellness uh, piece because I think it also um, has to do with our daily life and when you're in, especially in an urban environment and um, just when we were doing our um, urban retreat, it was, it, okay, we had to do, you know, three types of solar, we were doing rainwater capture, we were doing four different types of uh, different roofing membranes, the technology and trying to get it all done and I still remember the day we finished planning 1500 plugs in the green roof, you know, it, everybody was gone. I sat down and I went, oh my God, this place is beautiful. We have bees, we have squirrels, and we're in the middle of downtown Ann Arbor. And it, I don't know why it did not dawn on me that that was what, it was a magical moment. And our favorite thing to do was, you know, to, bring a, one of somebody's pet bunny up there and do yoga, you know, as the sun would set. It was just, it was, it, it was amazing. And that wasn't even in my head, you know? Yeah, first, that was my favorite place of any place at all to meet in Ann Arbor was, was in that office. And I also love the image of yogas doing bunny, or bunnies doing yoga, I'm sorry. Doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did quite a cool project with lighting here. I think that is something that I was encouraging my Ann Arbor friends to take advantage of. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the old moose lodges, if you remember those kind of mm -hmm. back in the day. We had um, a local community group here, New Sun Rising, who's super fantastic. Um, they work on, on a variety of aspects, but um, they bought an old moose lodge and no one knew what to do with it. So they decided to make it a food energy water hub for the community, kind of an incubator space for companies who are working in those three areas. Yeah. And we did a little DC nano grid. So Matt, I'll send you stuff. You'll geek out. It's super cool. Um, <laughs> and it's next to a bunch of breweries, which is also exciting for the millennials of the world, right? We kind of look, you can look down from a bunch of breweries that have popped up and see this field of solar. But what's really exciting is the lighting there is programmed to um, correspond also with um, not, it's kind of like changing environment uh, needs that employees need to be informed of. So, you know, they'll lower the blue lights if employees are, are responding or saying that they're having a stressful week, for instance. Um, if they know that there's a, t a strong thunderstorm coming in, they can kind of enhance, you know, the orange spectrum so that you feel protected. So it's really cool. They did tons of behavioral analysis. But I mean, for a small little project, it's it's amazing the feeling that you get whenever you come into the building. It's really neat. I'm already yeah. geeked out. Yeah, <laughs> you can come see it. I'll have a beer while you see I can it. See the hair on my arms grazing. It's like <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> well, I I think I, I we do have a couple more minutes. Did anybody want to talk about anything else that they had that they felt that they missed out on in their presentation with not enough time or? No, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just give a personal plug if I can because I'm terrible at this, uh, um, but. Uh, one of the other things that we need to decentralize and change is how all these projects are financed. I know Doug on his building and, and uh, Viridian, we're, we're, we're probably going to be going to where we are going to family funds and things like that to finance this rather than go through the conventional finance uh, banking system. Um, and, uh, and one of the things we're just experimenting with with a small amount, just $500,000 of the multi-million dollar raise is through crowdfunding. So we're going through a company called Local Stakes and we're allowing people in the neighborhood or anybody on this call to invest for as little as $500. And so they go to the, our website, viridianatcountyfarm.com and um, we've got people at Google and Silicon Valley investing $35,000 and we've got people who are, that live next door to the project investing $500. So not only are people are, and you can imagine the dynamics of that and how if you required something like this, like a certain percentage of your money had to come from the community in which you were building, we would really change what gets built. So this is one of the many, many things we're tweaking and playing with because we can with Viridian. 
And we could use the half million dollars too. It's like so it's helpful. Well, I wouldn't no problem, Matt. <laughs> Can I ask Matt a question? Is that allowed? Absolutely. So, in in all of you who are working on so many projects as well, especially in you know Ann Arbor and the broader Michigan area, it's so exciting. Have you looked at like the financial decentralized technologies like blockchain, like they've used in New York at all, or what's kind of like the appetite or um, discussion in that in in kind of the fintech world in your world? Yeah, totally. Um, the the challenge here is is you know I know about it. I followed the project since it started. The blockchain stuff and yeah. the microgrid. But there's no mechanism for that regulatory mechanism here in Michigan. We're, our, our innovation right now is, is community solar. Um, yeah. and we're still even struggling with that. Um, but that's changing really, really quickly. Consumers, energy on the other side of the state is doing some really neat stuff. Um, and uh, and DTE is, 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 they now have a climate leadership program. Um, so it's, uh, that's wonderful. So yeah, so that's kind of stuff like will be super helpful for Doug in his building. I mean, at some point, um, uh, you know, a builder like Doug in a, in a multifamily like that can really uh, have individual bedrooms, you know, paying for their own power or investing in solar themselves. Uh, Avalon Housing could be an investor in solar production um, and benefit financially from that. So that's pretty cool. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been a great, I've really enjoyed getting, you know, to know you, Katrina, and, uh, and Matt and Doug, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, to Evelyn, thank you. And in Michigan, we have a lot of government affairs um, advocacy coming up in the next year. And uh, it's, it, it's great to have so many people working and actually implementing things. So thank you. So it's great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jan, for putting this all together. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.